Hi, my name is Chuck. This is my first time at BSD CAN, and for some unexplained reason, I thought the most appropriate topic for a large BSD conference would be Linux. So this talk is going to cover Linux binary support on FreeBSD, some of the ways you can use it, and a little bit of my work to improve the current support. So a couple of preliminaries. I'm a FreeBSD developer by choice and write Linux device drivers because that pays the bills. So while I'm familiar with the GNU Linux versus Linux naming debate, it turns out I don't care and will use Linux interchangeably to refer to both the kernel and the operating system. Also, I don't hate Linux. So take any good-natured snarkiness that follows as just that, good-natured. But if you feel compelled to correct my use of the name or want me to stop being mean to Linux, uh, by all means, please do so. The email address to use for that is rstallman at gnu.org. <laughs> so there was this great Canadian TV show called Motive. My wife loved this show because the opening scene always showed the murderer killing the victim. The rest of the episode went through the events leading up to this. So in that spirit, here is the proverbial murder of this talk. So what you see here is the output of a terminal running two commands. The bottom is what it looks like building a Linux device driver if you've never had the pleasure. The top is the output from the command uname, which shows information about the system. Confusingly, this is showing that the system is running both a version of Linux and a version of FreeBSD. What this is, in fact, is a Cherooted Sent7 Docker container running via FreeBSD's Linux Ulator. The Linux version number is completely made up, but some of you might know that the police code for a 5150 means an involuntary psychiatric hold. The use here is coincidental. So when I was working on the background for the talk, I found a reference that said that support, Linux support has been in FreeBSD since 1995 and figured there was no way that was true and that had to be a typo. But spelunking back through the commits, I found this. And yes, in fact, support has been in FreeBSD since nearly the beginning of the project. And as you can see, it was for the goal of running the video game Doom. So that's awesome. So how is FreeBSD able to run unmodified Linux binaries? The precondition for all of this is the CPU architecture has to match the instruction set. Meaning, if the FreeBSD host is running on an x86 CPU, the Linux binaries also must use the x86 ISA. This same rule holds for other CPU architectures like ARM. Now this is different from a machine emulator like QEMU, which can emulate the instruction set of one CPU on a completely different CPU's architecture. And avoiding this translation allows Linux binaries to run at or near native speed on FreeBSD. But most applications are not self-contained, and they need help from the OS to do things like allocate memory, open up files, etc. Unix and Unix-like systems do this via well-defined system calls. And because FreeBSD and Linux both support a POSIX-compatible environment, many of the system calls are the same on both platforms. So a Linux application can make a system call and in many cases, the FreeBSD kernel only needs to translate the Linux-specific parameters to the FreeBSD equivalents. The rest of the system call is identical to one made by a FreeBSD, native FreeBSD application. But in some cases, there is no analog for that system call, and that must be specially implemented by the kernel. This support resides in three modules. There's Linux for 32-bit system calls, Linux 64 for 64-bit system calls, 
and Linux Common, which contains the functionality common to both the 32 and 64-bit modules. And when you compile these as loadable modules, the OS can simultaneously run both 32 and 64-bit applications. So this brings up the question, how does the kernel know when to use system calls for Linux and when does it use system calls for FreeBSD? The magic actually happens in the exec VE system call. This system call creates a new process from a binary. So for example, in a shell when you're running ls, exec VE gets called with slash bin slash ls. The kernel is then going to try to match this binary against a list of available loaders for file types that it recognizes. These file types include things like shell, a.out, gzip, and elf, with elf being the most common binary format for both Linux and FreeBSD applications. The elf loader then looks in the elf file header to determine the, the file for the file identification field. This has the ABI of uh, the, yeah, this has the ABI of that application. This is the branding of a binary and determine, differentiates Linux from FreeBSD. So with this information, the kernel is now able to load either a Linux system call table or a FreeBSD system call table. And this per process system call table also explains why you can have both 32 and 64 bit binaries running at the same time. There's one more wrinkle in this, in this, in this loader magic, and it's called the emulation path. This emulation path allows Linux binaries to effectively reroute themselves. This path for Linux is slash compat slash Linux. And by having this emulation path, when a Linux binary is running, it's going to, the OS is going to prefer binaries found under compat Linux to ones found under the base OS. This allows binaries to pick up the correct version, like a Linux version, instead of something that also happens to be named the same in the base OS. So this kind of begs the question, is this process really, really better called Linux emulation? Well, Emulation is one system imitating the behavior of another system without that innate or native behavior. So from an instruction set of point of view, this is clearly not emulation. As we've said as a precondition, the ISAs have to match. From a system call point of view, it depends on the system call, but in many cases, the answer is still, this is an emulation. But as we'll, we'll see later with some of the Linux pseudo file systems, the answer is definitely yes. So as a whole, the answer is it's complicated and leads to making up a name to describe all this, namely the Linux Ulator. So the easiest way to run, FreeBSD, to run Linux applications on FreeBSD is via the package system. So you would install these like you would any other application by running package install foo. And depending on the application, it's going to pull in dependencies from either CentOS 6 or CentOS 7. This is a list of some of the available applications. And you can see it runs the gamut. It's everything from games to VPN software to some chat and messaging applications. It's important to note that these are FreeBSD packages and not RPMs or DEBs. FreeBSD's PKG doesn't understand the format of DEBs or RPMs and really doesn't understand the layout of their repositories. 
So what this is instead is volunteers have taken RPMs and converted them by hand to PKGs. So this involves extracting all the files via RPM to CPIO, determining that package's dependencies, and then re-encoding all of this mess as a port make file. And while this process isn't bad for any one application, applications are typically going to pull in dozens of supporting binaries, or have dozens of supporting dependencies. And it's this proliferation of dependencies that prevents this process from scaling. So in my quest to build device drivers, the dependencies that I needed weren't horrible, but weren't trivi trivial either. Things like converting the headers, the Linux kernel build headers, wouldn't have been all that hard. And some of the packages were already available, like make and the compiler. All told, this probably would have been six or seven new RPMs. The bigger issue is the environment. Some applications don't really care where you install them, but build tools tend to be different. They are very fussy about where the headers are and where the libraries are and where they're installed. Now granted, in some cases you can tell the tools to look in alternate locations for these things. But typically they're not going to deal with the rerouting that is necessary to have all this running on FreeBSD. This is especially true in the case of Linux, as its build environment is very complex and has particular ideas about how things work. There's a wiki article on the FreeBSD site called Cross-Development of Linux Binaries on a FreeBSD System. The article actually has a very good discussion of the approach taken to integrate Linux binaries with FreeBSD, and why that general approach doesn't work for the specific case of building applications. The answer turns out to be to create a mini Linux environment on the system and cheroot into it to trick Linux into thinking everything is where it's supposed to be. The bones of the article are good, but the solution isn't immediately useful because it uses a package that isn't available anymore. And recreating a new package is problematic as my knowledge of how a Linux system is put together consists of load the install CD, click next, next, static IP, next, done, wait 10 minutes and boot into a running system. Granted, there are about 2.7 million different Linux distributions, so the process can't be all that hard, but it felt like something I didn't want to reinvent. So while encouraging, this was ultimately a fail. My previous employer shipped an appliance based on Ubuntu 10.04 the 10 meaning software built in 2010. Over time, it came, became difficult to replace the build server as this older software didn't recognize the newer hardware. The answer to this turned out to be buy a bigger, faster server, install a version of Ubuntu on it that recognized the new hardware, and then create a Linux container to run Ubuntu 10.04 to build our appliances software. Linux containers look a little bit like jails, provided you are far-sighted and don't have your glasses handy. But the important thing to focus on here is both methods have a single kernel instance and support user, multiple, multiple user space environments. And these environments can be older than the kernel that they typically come, came with. One of the nice properties of containers is you can keep the software up to date using the native package management tools. LXC, which is the project that 
deals with containers, creates containers via templates. These are basically glorified bash scripts which set up the directory structure, download RPMs with curl, extract them, and set up a configuration for LXC's use. This actually felt like a really good recipe to create a mini Linux environment on FreeBSD, as all of these tools exist on FreeBSD. Unfortunately, partway through this process, RPM crashes for some reason. It turns out that RPM is a huge application with an even larger set of ancillary scripts and programs and libraries. And debugging that was not the project I had in mind. So while this pointed in a good direction, again, it was a fail. So just when you thought a talk at a BSD conference couldn't go any more into the weeds, let's talk about Windows. Windows Subsystem for Linux provides a compatibility environment for Linux on Windows. So what, this, what Windows does is it creates a special process with a system call table compatible with Linux health binaries. Stop me if you've heard this. And because they worked with Canonical, the original user space environment was Ubuntu, which for me was fine but not everyone loves Ubuntu the same, and they wanted their own environments. So one WSL user found that WSL kept the Linux root file system separate from the user's directory, and hypothesized that it should be possible to switch out that root file system to be able to run the environment of their choice. He ended up putting together a set of Python scripts to allow downloading these distributions by name and installing them on Windows. And while these scripts aren't immediately useful to FreeBSD, the concept is. So his, the key observation was that he could use Docker Hub, which is a registry of Docker images that the Docker tools use. We could download any official Linux distribution from Docker Hub as a tarball, create a ZFS data set, extract it into that data set, and you have a Linux environment. Then, depending on how you wanted to manage this, you could either use that environment as is, maybe updating it when the upstream maintainers do, or alternatively, you could go into it and use its package management tools to keep it up to date or add other applications and libraries as you need it. So now that we have a base image, we need a couple of other pieces to make this a real Linux system. The LinProcFS driver adds an emulated Linux process file system for a subset of the entries that you would normally find under proc on Linux. You would use a mount command similar to what you see up here to enable this. Every process that's running on the system will have an entry under slash proc named after its process ID. Inside the processes directory, you'll find other files that give you information about the command line that invoked that process, the environment variables that were in place, memory that it's allocated, and a bunch of other things. So here we're looking at a proc, a Linux proc file system that was running on my machine. And in particular, we can take a look at process 3742. Inside of process 3742, there's the file command line, which gives you all of the command line options that are running. And as you can see, this is actually the LibreOffice presentation software that I was using to create this. Now the top level directory also has some non, some information that's not specific to any particular process. 
This is going to include things like the boot parameters for the kernel, um, uptime, kernel version, those sorts of things. I should probably mention, too, that this is a virtual or pseudo file system, meaning that the entries in here aren't associated with any real physical character or block device. These are just files. The LinSysFS driver adds an emulated kernel subsystem file system and supports a subset of the entries that you would normally find under slash sys on a Linux system. Again, like the procfs, you'd use a mount command to enable this, something like that. And like its Linux counterpart, this is a pseudo file system that gives you information about kernel subsystems, hardware, and some device drivers. So for example, a lot of Linux utilities basically repackage the information found under sys in a more human readable fashion. So this includes applications like LSPCI, LSSCSI, and CPU info. DevFS adds a device file system that gives you access to certain kernel devices. Now, while the base OS is typically going to mount this on slash dev, this file system can actually be mounted multiple times and in multiple locations. This allows you to support multiple jails or other cherooted environments. So here we can see that we're mounting this under compat Linux dev, which would be a pretty typical thing to do. Now, by default, the contents of all of these instances are the same which you may not want due to security implications for your cherooted or jailed environments. The rub is many applications need things like dev null and dev zero to do their thing. So you can't just outright prevent this use. Instead, what you want to do is use devfs and devfs rule sets to tailor the output depending on what your needs are. There are a couple of others that are kind of little minor ones that neither are particularly Linux specific, but it would be good to mention them here. The first is the file descriptor file system, which says, sounds weird every time I say it. This gives processes access to the file descriptors that they have opened. The one thing to point out here is there is a Linux specific option called linreadlink. And what this does is this gives a, the Linux specific behavior for file descriptors, which turns out to be that they're symbolic links instead of being the actual files that were opened. NullFS, again, isn't specific to anything Linux related, but it provides a really useful way to share directories between the host OS and your cherooted or jailed environment. OK, so now we have a complete Linux environment. What should we do with it? So running a ping in a cheroot is a little silly, but it served as a useful in introduction to the Linux later. Unfortunately, when you do it, you see this. It gives you the amusing message, your kernel is very old. No problems. And then spews a flood of address family not supported. This goes on forever, making it impossible to debug. But then you remember ping has a count option to allow you to do a single ping, which reminds you of that one ping only scene in that movie with Sean Connery, and you're off to the races. Because the first error message talks about the age of the kernel, the obvious thing to do is maybe change that. FreeBSD allows you to set the reported Linux version number via a sysctl. That's compat Linux OS release. 
So the easy thing to do is go change that from its default value of 2.632 to something more recent like 3.10. Unfortunately, this makes absolutely no difference. But fortunately, the, message, the error message is unique enough that you can actually track it down. And what this turns out to be is a call to set SOC op IP receive error. This allows passing back ICMP errors to the application and has been available in Linux since about version 2.2. No other Unices have this same system call, which is why it's freaking out here. Fortunately, when you put in IP receive error emulation, the first web search that pops up is a GitHub issue on Joyent's Illumos repository. Now, while it wasn't the exact same problem, it provided a lot of really good background to help me actually fix this, and was a reminder that Joanne has been down this path before. And actually, their code base has been a really good resource in my journey to get some of this stuff fixed. And I appreciate that they've done this and open sourced it. The pattern, the, the error is also a curious pattern in that there are many applications that require system calls to succeed, but don't require that they do anything. So in this case, the fix was to return a good status and then never return anything. Application is fat, dumb, and happy. There were a couple of other fixes to get all of these error messages and a couple of others to go away that followed a similar pattern. So there were a couple of socket ioctal calls and a couple of socket option calls that also you needed to return a good status but do nothing else. There may also be a bug in the sock adder sock receive message processing on Linux. I should have a, re a review up on Fabricator for that soon if somebody can take a look at it. Ping was also a good introduction into Linux capabilities. Capabilities on Linux are a fine-grained mechanism to limit the power of the super user. And these either map to a specific operation, like make nod, or it maps to a group of operations, like the horrid capnet admin, which applies to everything. So each of these capabilities has three values as an effective, a permitted, and an inheritable value. And the set, cap the set capabilities or get capability calls are all done in the context of the current process. The current Linux Ulator implementation will return that no capabilities are set for all cap get calls and will return an error for all calls that try to set a capability. Amazingly, this works. And it works because a lot of applications repeat a pattern that looks something like this. So in human, this says, see if a particular capability is set. And if it's not set, try to set it. So in the Linux Elator case, it will return that, regardless of what it's passed there, it will return that that capability is not set. And then when the Linux application tries to set it, it will return an error. But a large number of applications never check the return value of that set call, and so everything appears to still be working. <laughs> Yay, we got lucky. So the question is, how do you fix this? If you look at FreeBSD's privileges that are defined in Priv9, they map pretty well to the Linux capabilities. With the net admin probably being some oring of priv net, routing, bridging, lag, blah, a bunch of them. But all in all, it maps pretty well. And actually, when you, when you implement Linux's cap get in terms of priv check, things actually do work a little bit better for applications that would have checked the error message, the error status on cap set calls. 
But the big open question is, how would you then set these capabilities? Because the PRIV9 man page is very clear that this is a privilege checking API. Instead, it's counting on something like Jails or Mac to actually set the capabilities. So while something like this might make sense if you were running this in a jail, what if you just run the binary by itself or in a cheroot? Do we need to have a Mac module specific to Linux? Or is Capsicum maybe a better primitive to use to implement this? I don't know. But if one of you does, please help me out. MREMAP. MREMAP is a system call implemented on Linux. And much like Moby Dick, my quest to make this one work may be the death of me. This system call expands or shrinks an existing memory mapping, potentially moving it at the same time, all while preserving the original contents of memory. The dizziness you are now feeling is normal and will pass in a minute. The intent of this call is to implement a very efficient realloc. This was widely seen by the other Unices as a good idea. Two, a problem with no other solution. And in fact, Illumos implements Emory map for LX branded zones with a combination of MMAP and MEMCOPY. So all giving Linux a hard time aside, none of that really matters, as there are big pieces of key Linux infrastructure that all depend on this system call. This covers everything from apt to yum, to RPM, to several flavors of malloc, UC libc, bin utils. You get the picture. So if you want to be running Linux applications on FreeBSD, this is a system call we need to support. So since the goal is to implement an efficient realloc, let's talk a little bit about that library call. So the intent of that realloc is to resize a previous memory allocation. And again, it preserves the original contents of the memory. The catch is that when you realloc something, the memory address may change. So it could move, and you have to account for that. So to understand how mremap figures into this, we need to talk a little bit about memory allocation. When an application is allocating memory, it's allocating two related resources, physical memory and virtual address space. The physical memory, like you'd find in DIMMs, is the actual memory of the system. Applications get access to this via virtual addresses provided by the OS. So the goal of mremap is to adjust the virtual address range without touching the physical pages. There you go. Sorry. If this isn't possible, mremap needs to allocate a new virtual address range and map the existing physical pages to that range. The performance implication is that you avoid the copy, and this should be faster. So, all told, this probably breaks down into three big cases. Actually, it's four, but the fourth one is almost identical to the third. So in the first case, we're going to truncate an existing memory allocation. Here, the, the new mapping is going to be smaller than the previous mapping. In this case, memory map needs to reduce the end virtual address range and then can free any pages between new length and old length. In the next case, we're going to extend the mapping. Now, if there is available virtual address space after this mapping, we can increase the end address of that 
range. Add some new physical pages, and we're all set. But what if there isn't room after that virtual address? That could happen as the result of another allocation by that same application. In this case, <laughs> mremap needs to allocate a new virtual address space, map the existing physical pages to their new virtual addresses, add new physical address to account for the increased size, and free the old virtual address space. In the fourth case that I mentioned, the user supplies the new virtual address instead of letting the OS pick one. So as you can see, this can lead to an optimal realloc, but there's a lot of care and planning that needs to go into this. And by the time you do that, MMAP can do all of this in a much more portable way. If you aren't careful, most calls fall into this third case. And whether that's more efficient and faster depends on the circumstance. But it probably is. Maybe. OK, so changing gears a little bit, let's say, purely hypothetically, of course, that you're working on system calls which map memory to user space applications and have no idea what you're doing. The inevitable result, as the C programmers out there are mumbling, is a core dump. So when the OS detects a fatal error in an application, it can save off the state of that process. A programmer can then use it, save off the state of that process into a file called a core dump. A programmer can use, then use that core dump in conjunction with a debugger, like GDB, to figure out the underlying cause of the error and fix it. Now, the most common reason that you would get a core dump is an application accessing memory that it doesn't have access to. But there are other things that can cause a core dump. This includes executing an illegal instruction, floating point exceptions, and explicitly signaling an abort. So what is the state of a program? This includes the current CPU register values, any memory that's been allocated, loaded libraries, open file descriptors, pending signals, and so on. The register set is especially important as it gives you the instruction where the error happened, a pointer to the memory location of the current stack, and a pointer to the location of the return stack, or the caller of this function. Taken together, the debugger can use this to display the stack of function calls leading up to this error, referred to as a stack trace or backtrace. One other thing to mention is that a core dump doesn't make any sense by itself and always has to be interpreted in the context of the running program. So let's, take a, let's talk for a minute about what the structure of a core dump is. At a very high level, Core files use the standardized ELF file format, or extendable linking format. ELF files all have a header that contains the OS type, the instruction set architecture, and the object type. ELF is defined that an object type of four indicates that a file is a core dump. Unfortunately, that's where the standard stops and leaves all the remaining details in the dreaded implementation specific category. Now both Linux and FreeBSD package the process state in a series of note sections. So for example, there's a section for the registers, maps, signals, file descriptors, and so on. <laughs> and applications running via the Linux Ulator can, can create core dumps. But there's a problem. So when you look at a core dump on FreeBSD, you'll see this. Here the error is indicating that the GDB doesn't recognize the ABI of the application. 
So while the FreeBSD kernel is able to deal with Linux binaries, other applications won't necessarily. Trying this on Linux, you see a different problem. Here, GDB recognizes the ABI of the application, but the ABI of the core file doesn't match and isn't familiar. From FreeBSD's point of view, this is, a, this is a BSD process, and so the ABI should be FreeBSD. Now, you can go in by hand and edit this to say that the core file type is ABI is Linux, and that does make this initial error message go away, but GDB still doesn't recognize this as a core file. So given that ELF doesn't define anything else about a core file structure, how is GDB determining that this is not a core file? The answer is the size of the process status note section. So if you go into the GDB source code and you navigate to the grok PR status, PR status stands for the process status, you'll find this bit of code. Here the description size is the size of the PR status note section. And if it happens to be 296 bytes, this is a 32-bit core file. If it happens to be 336 bytes, this is a 64-bit core file. Otherwise, it's not a core file. So the fix here is to add a Linux-specific core dump handler that writes out the process status section in a format that's compatible with Linux. And once we do this, we actually start getting some useful information out of GDB. So here we're using NPM to install a Node.js application. Unfortunately, partway through, it core dumps. Passing this core dump to GDB, we can see that the program terminated because of an abort signal. Running the backtrace command, we can see that this abort starts in frame number two. Let's take a closer look at that. So here again is frame number two, showing that the function is read times in a file called linuxcore.c. When we open up linuxcore.c and navigate to read times, we find this called scanf. scanf parses a string looking for a particular pattern, and in this case is six numbers. The return value is the number of parameters correctly parsed and assigned to variables. In this case, if it doesn't find six variables, it's going to trigger an abort. An abort is going to terminate the process and generate the core dump. So it feels like we're getting closer. In this case, the string being passed to scanf is the output of proc stat. So if we break out to a shell, we can see that proc stat only has four numbers for each of the entries. When linprocfs was originally written, this was correct. But over the time, <laughs> Linux has added things, and this is no longer true. Fortunately, the answer is you go in and you fix the procstat pseudofile system entry and adapt it to the five different cases when Linux changed things. <laughs> but with that, the node application installs and you're good to go. So what was the point of all of this? Because Honestly, there are much easier ways to build Linux device drivers. So if nothing else, this provides an artifact on the web that describes some of the pieces of Linux functionality on FreeBSD, a bit of how they work, and some ways to use them. To me, the most interesting part was most of the work was ex extending existing functionality. And the hard parts were only hard because of my ignorance. So with not that many new lines of code, 
FreeBSD was able to let me get my job done and gave me a better workflow. And since this was so useful to me, I wanted to talk to the rest of you and see if you might find something like this useful too. If the answer is yes, the question is, where do you go from here? Now, people have mentioned in the past that it would be great to have end user applications like Skype. But I wonder if it wouldn't be smarter to build on the strength of the OS as a server. Now, it wouldn't be enough to just run Linux containers as a service. There would have to be a compelling reason for people to switch. But what if we added some additional tooling on top of things like jails and ZFS and DTrace that actually made running and maintaining containers better on FreeBSD? I have no idea what this looks like, but I'm hoping you might. And this isn't just more work in the kernel. We need in input from users to tell us which of the most important containers to target would be. We need UI expertise to make this process easy. We need some user space hackers to actually make the hard parts of this work. And yes, we'd probably need some more bits in the kernel to give the nuts and bolts of this. So if this is interesting to you, please let me know. Thank you. Questions? No. Oh, okay. So when you were when you were like kind of going through like that core dump in GDB, like so have you have you ever tried doing it with you know like even though it's still kind of new LLVM? Uh, yes. Initially, I tried I tried all the debuggers, and I should have I should have had a try all debuggers sign. But no, it's it's the same problem. Basically, you have. Core files are underspecified, and so it needs to be the same sort of thing. So my assumption is that LLDB would have had the same problem. I, actually, I know LLDB threw errors for, for both on FreeBSD and Linux. The error messages are different than what GDB shows, but based on what I know about GDB now, I'm pretty sure that LLDB would be fine now, too. Yep, no, everybody, everybody had problems. And, and really, really the, the root of the issue is that you kind of have this, um, this Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde sort of thing going on, right? I mean, so you have effectively Linux applications and FreeBSD state. And so you would almost need like a cross debugger sort of thing to make it all work. So the easy answer is, and, and, the, and the way I approached it was, hey, we're running Linux applications, so let's make the core dump look like a Linux core dump. So if you did port over uh, a Linux GDB, how exactly would that fail? What would that failure look like? Um, let's see. So, That's the so the, the second one is a Linux GDB. No, nope. That is so that so this GD this is a Linux GDB looking at a Linux application with a core dump created by FreeBSD. I'm sorry, I probably blew through that too quickly on the slide. But yeah, so the so the top of this is so in both cases this is a Linux binary being run on FreeBSD. In the first case, I'm using the GDB found on FreeBSD to decode it. And so while that GDB probably would understand the format of the core file, it gets stuck on the application and says, oops, I don't know what to do with no Linux. The second case is the GDB from Linux. And here, it understands what the ABI of the application is, but the core dump format is, is wrong. I, all I fixed was the core dump. Okay. 
So, so, there's, so when you look at the inner workings of how processes get kicked off, there's the, the place the syscall table gets installed, there's also a hook for how do we write out a core dump. And so the answer here was to create a special version of that function specifically for Linux applications and then largely steal all the FreeBSD bits but change the, the, sec, the part of the code that writes out the PR status. And once I write that out in a format that Linux expects, life is better. Then you use the Linux yep, yep. Because kind of the assumption is if you're running Linux applications, eh, use the Linux GDB to debug stuff. How hard would it have been to fix GDB to recognize the FreeBSD core format? I don't know. <laughs> because that sounds like it would be fairly broadly useful for people working across different platforms. It's, it, it's a good point, and I struggled with it. What I didn't want to get into was being the maintainer of the FreeBSD GDB that knew what Linux core dumps looked like, or core, uh, that. Like, Would that have been better or worse than being the maintainer of the Linux GDB that knew what FreeBSD core dumps looked like? You said I was the maintainer. No, no, you fixed fix the core dumps so they're not Linux core dumps. See? Yeah. Done. <laughs> so it's, it's stock GDB. It's, it's stock yeah. Linux GDB. LLDB internally um, has knowledge of both core, uh, core uh, user land cores uh, internally. Um, so on FreeBSD, uh, an LLDB should be able to, on FreeBSD, an uh, LLDB should be able to open a Linux binary and a Linux core file, or a FreeBSD binary and a FreeBSD core file with the same LLDB binary. Um, it, it still doesn't like the cross threading, but that's um, really just an assertion. It's not fundamentally the way LLDB is designed. Um, I actually, uh, I was working on bringing up um, ARM64 emulators so I can try LLDB doing live debugging of a, of a Linux process, um, and that died with an assertion failure, and I just took out the assertion, and it worked. Um, mm. So in other words, it didn't, it, it didn't mind using a Linux binary and FreeBSD live ptrace interface. Uh, so I think, I think this is something that could be done in LLDB rel relatively um, straight in a relatively straightforward manner, but certainly uh, I think the, the, uh, the, overlying, uh, the overall point that Linux tools, use Linux tools on, with, on Linux binaries and have Linux core file formats is going to make everything just kind of work uh, more smoothly and you can use the same tool to yep. follow a Linux tutorial or Linux script, it's just going to work. Yep, yep, yep. Other questions? Oh, yeah, I was just going to on the um, you like that node, what was it using, using proc, proc stat, I think you said. Yep. Format. Yep. I was curious, have you tried other runtimes like like a JVM, like a Linux JVM, a no, you know, no JVM, like Go, but a Go Linux binary, um, just to see like what all the gaps were there. Some of them I think will use syscalls directly, and then other ones will use the pseudo file systems to do God knows what. It, yeah, uh, it, it, uh, that would be my guess as well. Um, to answer your question directly, I... I did kind of a shotgun approach to see what would work, see if I couldn't have some cool looking demo for this presentation. Uh, the fact that you're not getting one is uh, an indication of where I ended up. So uh, there are, there's probably a ton of stuff. And, and the real challenge here is, do I go debug stuff that nobody cares about? Right? I mean, so it, so it really kind of comes down to, you know, I'm willing to go move whatever rocks people want me to go move, but without a little bit of direction, I could be, I could be wasting my time. But if you want to start running Go things on there. I would just, I mean, I would add just more, like, more, more of a curiosity just because a lot of the, you know, deep, like, um, uh, managed runtimes are doing all kinds of their own things. So it's, it seems like that. As a test bench, mm -hmm. getting all of those working is probably going to unlock a whole class of uh, portability, uh, or at least point to a, a class of portability concerns. Uh, I don't know. My my suspicion is, I have I have almost I have M remap almost working. 
And, and my suspicion is that that is a fundamental stumbling block for a bunch of the things that, that I'm trying. Um, and, and I almost have it working. But and as soon as I get that working, I think we'll be able to open up the, a bunch of stuff. Now, amazingly, a lot of things just work. I mean, there, th this, this is very usable. I use this three days a week to do my work from home. So it's very functional. It makes me very happy. I can turn off that Linux box that was old and noisy. So, so my life is better. Yep. If you believe what you hear on the internet, there was a talk from uh, by Brian Cantrell, um, and his assertion was he felt like Linus had gotten religion in terms of ABI stability, and so his belief was that the interface to Linux or for Linux applications is now somewhat sacred and thus moving at a much, much slower pace. So we might be able to ju just catch up and be in pretty good shape. Now, let me throw a wet towel on all of this. There's something out there called the Linux test plan, and it's, it's effectively a bunch of scripts that run tests that test all sorts of Linux system calls and network stuff and da 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 If you go run that, we pass about 54% of those tests, which for code that hasn't been touched in a while doesn't feel all that bad to me. But there are a lot of tests in there, and so it's, it's a huge environment, and it sort of feels like something where you wouldn't just want to go fix all the tests. I mean, we could, but I would, I'd need some help. Um, the current version is is mostly sort of two six twelve, I think, or twenty. I think it's I think it's technically two six twenty something, twenty two maybe. Absolutely, absolutely. And so that's and so some of the 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 things that I'm doing here are kind of bringing in newer bits to uh, the kernel to support those newer capabilities so that it looks like a more recent version of the kernel. Any specific applications you want to support? My driver builds work, so I'm good. <laughs> so what, what, what applications would you like to see? Uh, I don't know. Then we're done. No. I'm <laughs> Okay. So, in theory, if the entire Linux test pass, is that any value? No. <laughs> and I say this because all of the M remap tests on, on LTP currently pass. And they actually pass before I even had a halfway, ver halfway working version of M remap. So, it's, it's, it's a little, we could have 100% coverage, which, even Microsoft doesn't have. But we could have that and still have some holes. So, but it's a good question. Do you know their test coverage? What percentage of the implementation? I don't remember off the top of my head. But it is a part of uh, every time they do a release, they, they do an LTP report. Yeah, it's just Linux. <laughs> Do you have any 
So I'm a FreeBSD contributor and not a Linux contributor, and that's not by accident. I've tried to contribute things back to Linux in the past and have been wildly unsuccessful. So I, I, have, I do have some additional tests that I created just for my own purposes because LTP was kind of not as helpful as I'd like in this area. But um, yeah, it's probably something worth looking at. So I think I'm officially out of time. Any other questions? Thank you for enduring with me.